Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And thanks to all of you for turning out on this windy afternoon. I was uh, very pleased when Dean Paxson asked me to uh, give the first in this series on implementing healthcare reform. When I worked in the White House in 1993, one of my uh, responsibilities was to think through the phasing of healthcare reform, how we would get from here to there. Unfortunately, of course, we never got there. <laughs> so I'm glad to be able to talk about that now. Uh, I remember uh, in the spring of 93 uh, being asked at the last minute uh, to fill in for Ira Magaziner and to speak to 800 state legislators at the National Association of State Legislators in Washington that spring. And not being practiced in the ways of Washington, I responded to a question from one of the state legislators about how long it would take to uh, uh, implement health care reform. And uh, I said, well, you know, the really reforms won't start rolling out best until 1996. The process won't be finished realistically until late in the decade. The next day, that was a banner headline in USA Today. And it was very nice to come back to Princeton in the fall. <laughs> uh, so here we are again, talking about the phase and how we get from here to there, this time with some chance of actually getting there. Now, after Congress establishes a program, the next steps are usually thought of as a bureaucratic process of policy implementation. The politics is done, the executive agencies and perhaps the courts take over. But the legislation Congress passed last March, the Patient Protection um, and um, uh, Affordable Care Act, is different, is different. Uh, it has to be implemented not just bureaucratically, it's going to have to be implemented politically. Because the major provisions of the law don't go into effect until 2014. It's going to be it's going to have to be defended, not just at this election, this fall, but also in 2012. Its implementation will also depend on complementary action in 50 state legislatures, including many states where the political leaders uh, are hostile to the law, have denounced it, uh, in some cases have passed resolutions nullifying uh, the law are challenging its constitutionality in court. And in addition, the reforms need to win not just the passive support, but the active cooperation of employers, insurers, providers, and the public at large, despite all the opposition and confusion about the law. Now, even in the best circumstances, the Affordable Care Act would need to be implemented politically. In 2006, Massachusetts passed the prototype for the federal reforms by requiring individuals to carry health insurance, by increasing subsidies for low-income people, and setting up an insurance exchange to make affordable coverage easily available. The Massachusetts program enjoyed overwhelming bipartisan support. It had the support of the Democratic legislature. It had the backing. It was really initiated by the Republican governor, Mitt Romney. And Scott Brown, who was in the state Senate, was one of the many who voted for it. <laughs> Nonetheless, John Kingsdale, who um, I've known for 30 years, old friend of mine, was appointed to run the insurance exchange. He says that when he took the job, the best advice he got came from the former Lieutenant Governor, Tom O'Neill, who told him, John, it's a political campaign from the day you start. And that's just what it turned out to be. Winning the cooperation of all the interested parties, as well as the public at large, was like running a political campaign. And everybody involved in the implementation of this law has to understand that. The national effort to carry out the Affordable Care Act 
will, if anything, require more political finesse and political determination. Now, after the legislation passed Congress, the President and many other people immediately compared it to Social Security and Medicare. Well, if the Affordable Care Act eventually becomes as well institutionalized as the other two, the comparisons will be apt. But this legislation is much more difficult to carry out than those two programs. For one thing, neither Social Security nor Medicare <coughs> depends on the cooperation of the states, or at least depended for their initial implementation on the states. In that respect, the Affordable Care Act has a closer resemblance to school integration and other civil rights measures that had to be carried out over the resistance of local political leaders. In 1965, the opposition to Medicare collapsed immediately after the law passed Congress, where the compromise that had been engineered by Wilbur Mills, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, helped Medicare get significant support from a Republican Party that was very different from the Republican Party that exists today. And as the political scientist Martha Durthick writes about Medicare, all the ideological intensity that had gone into the battle just dissipated afterward, just really went away. Uh, that has obviously not happened now. In addition, Medicare was fully implemented within one year. And it had overwhelming support right from the start. The Affordable Care Act will take four years to implement. Uh, the public, uh, pu public opinion is still sharply divided about it. And voters are going to go to the polls in 2012 still without having seen substantial benefits from the law, assuming it survives until then. So there is a much greater possibility that this legislation will not be fully implemented that its major provisions will be repealed or rolled back or substantially modified. But even amid this fundamental uncertainty, things are moving ahead. Some important short-term measures have already been carried out. More are on the way. Many people are at work on the long-term changes, even in states where the governor or legislators, le legislators are fulminating against the federal law. Changing health policy is difficult enough, just as a policy problem. Changing health care in a hostile, not to mention financially stressed political environment is just an extraordinary challenge. To understand this task that uh, we face, I think we have to understand why and how Congress passed health care reform this year, what it was able to pass, and why health care reform almost ended in the kind of deadlock that has blocked congressional action on climate and energy, immigration, and so many other vital matters this year. As I'm sure all of us remember, the battle over health care reform was a political roller coaster. There were repeated moments when the chances of passing the legislation plummeted and it seemed to go off the rails during the hot summer of <coughs> 2009 with all those angry town meetings. And then in the fall, when uh, the House and Senate uh, came to vote, and uh, both <coughs> Majority Leader Reed and Nancy Pelosi had to make desperate compromises in order to get the bills passed the first time. And then in January, after Scott Brown's election, when many people pronounced health care reform dead. And then in the final moments leading up to the House's vote on the Senate bill, when Bart Stupak and another, several other uh, uh, anti-abortion uh, Democrats held life and death power over health care reform. And again, somehow, it escaped and survived. Now, each time, uh, the President um, and the two leaders of Congress, Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid, uh, managed to rescue uh, health care reform. It, it would never have passed without their committed leadership. But there's a prior question. How did health care reform even get to that point, even get to the point where it had a realistic possibility of uh, passing the Congress? Um, now, I try to answer that question and others 
in a book that I'm writing <laughs> about the long struggle over health care reform. <coughs> and I don't want to spill the entire account here. Um, but there is one difference between 2010 and the earlier episodes that um, needs emphasizing. By 2009, unlike 1935, 1946, 1974, or 1993, there was a rough but substantial consensus about the general design of reform shared by leading healthcare reform groups and um, the major interest groups in the healthcare industry. A consensus that extended to the president, and the congressional leadership, including the chairs of key committees in both houses of Congress. That degree of consensus was unprecedented. In 1993, I used to say we had a negative consensus that something was wrong with the health care system and that we needed to turn that negative consensus into a positive consensus about how to fix it. But we were never able to do that. The Clinton plan it may be hard to believe now, was conceived as a compromise. Instead of proposing a government insurance plan, it relied entirely on private health plans, which individual consumers would be able to choose through what were originally called health insurance purchasing cooperatives, then renamed regional alliances, and now are known as insurance exchanges. Much of the healthcare industry was open to that approach. The big insurers, the hospital industry, even the AMA. But the Clinton plan also called for other things, including strong cost containment measures, caps on the growth rate of the average premium in the, in the purchasing alliances, which would have limited overall health spending and which the industry and many people and much of the public didn't want. And because the Clinton plan called for virtually everyone under age 65 to get their insurance through a single community-wide pool, it appeared to many people to threaten their existing health insurance, uh, their em employer provided health insurance, though the Clinton plan would have required employers to contribute a share of the premium and actually it would have given most people more choices than they already had, but oh well, forget that argument. By, 19, by, by 2008, several changes had taken place. I think most important, Massachusetts had adopted its reforms, so there was a working model of an insurance exchange instead of an abstract concept of a purchasing alliance as there was in 93. Now, the Massachusetts exchange was on a much smaller scale than the Clinton alliances, targeted to those who would otherwise have to buy insurance individually or through small uh, business. Massachusetts had reached near universal coverage through what was essentially a two-pronged approach. First, by expanding Medicaid, and then by adopting an individual mandate and affordability for subsidies for people with incomes just above the poverty level to enable them to buy coverage in an exchange that operated under new rules. And Massachusetts helped to crystallize uh, the idea that although the results would be less than ideal, particularly as to cost containment. Universal coverage would be feasible on the basis of that downsized two-prong design, relying on Medicaid expansion for the poor and on insurance market reforms, insurance exchange, and affordability subsidies for others without coverage. Now, I say that was a big scaling back reform because if you look at all the proposals after 1965, whether it was Kennedy's plan in the late 60s or Nixon's plan in the early 70s or uh, uh, a whole slew of others uh, through the 80s and 90s, Clinton plan, many others. They all called for the elimination of Medicaid. Medicaid was seen as uh, completely inadequate uh, because of uh, the low payment rates to doctors which resulted in many doctors refusing to serve Medicaid beneficiaries because of other problems with the Medicaid program. Everybody wanted to wanted to get beyond Medicaid. Henry Waxman, who uh, uh, successfully, beginning in the 80s, uh, engineered the slow expansion of Medicaid, uh, also regarded any program that was just for poor people as being a poor program. That was the line that basically all progressives had on Medicaid. 
So the idea of building on Medicaid was really fundamentally unacceptable to, uh, to most Democrats. Nonetheless, after Massachusetts, in the years leading up to 2009, that period in there, consensus formed, it's going to have to be Medicaid. We're not going to expand Medicare. The original expectation had been it would be Medicare that would be the basis of universal coverage. Instead, Medicaid and tax credits for people to buy private insurance. A very big shift from what liberals had earlier proposed. Um, meanwhile, the healthcare interest groups had come around to the view that uh, that they could benefit reform, maybe that they even needed reform. The relentless rise in health costs was threatening the viability of the individual and small group insurance markets. As insurance rates rose, more healthy people were deciding not to insure, threatening to raise premiums further and potentially sending the individual and small group markets into a death spiral. So the industry was willing to accept insurance market reforms, guaranteed issue, modified community rating, no lifetime limitations, if they could get an individual mandate and affordability subsidies that would, in, that would in effect enlarge their otherwise shrinking market. And from the standpoint of the hospitals, the physicians and other providers, providing private coverage to the uninsured was clearly desirable. As long as they could avoid price controls or a government insurance plan capable of dictating prices. <laughs> What was not to like, really, from their point of view? Moreover, as one lobbyist put it to me, anybody looking ahead could see that there would be cuts in Medicare payment rates in the future, that there would be cuts in Medicare just for, because of the overall fiscal situation. So why not preempt those cuts and use the savings now to cover the uninsured, in which case the money would come back to the healthcare industry. So why not make that kind of a deal? There was, in fact, a deal begging to be made, a deal that could bring the healthcare interest groups and the reformers together instead of putting them on the opposite sides, which is where they had mostly been in the past. And uh, that deal, that deal wasn't struck in 1994. But it was struck uh, finally in 2009, thanks to a number of people. I would say especially thanks to Max Blockus, um, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. So the result was that in 2010, the opposition to health reform legislation came hardly at all from the usual suspects, from the interest groups that had uh, been the chief opponents in the past. Instead, the opposition was entirely partisan and ideological. It's not to say it was small, but it was, it, it, was, it was different in character from what it had been. The Republican Party had changed from 1965, when there were a lot of liberals and moderates in the Republican Party who had supported Medicare. It had changed from 1974, when Richard Nixon proposed a universal coverage plan with an employer mandate and with a government program for everybody who didn't have employer-based coverage. Amazing to think about that. The Republican Party had even changed from 1993 when Senator John Chafee had more than 20 co-sponsors on a bill that would have established an individual mandate, uh, a bill for tax credits, an individual mandate. The way the media framed the debate back then, it was Democrats who favored an employer mandate. Republicans favored an individual mandate, the principle of individual responsibility. That was a conservative principle. Of course, that individual mandate is now heresy <coughs> in the Republican Party. It's totally anathema. Uh, it's one of these uh, remarkable reversals that um, uh, so often uh, happens uh, in, in politics. Um, uh, but people who have any memory of what uh, uh, positions um, uh, people took uh, not really that long ago. We'll see that it's, it's, uh, it's extraordinary. The, the approach to reform that Democrats and these healthcare interest groups agreed on in 2009, an approach that called for tax credits for private health insurance, an individual mandate, insurance exchanges, all within a framework that reduces the deficit over the long term, 
that, that might have been a Republican proposal in the past. It easily could have been. Um, it's a phenomenon that uh, I described uh, now is, as bipartisanship in one party. You have the Democratic Party putting forward proposals that actually have a kind of Republican lineage to them. Um, I'm just waiting for some moderate Republicans to stand up and say, we won. <laughs> this is essentially what we were calling for. But I guess I'm not expecting that to happen anytime <laughs> soon uh, because any Republican who said that now would be excoriated by the Tea Party. For all its compromises, the Affordable Care Act is still the single most progressive reform since the 1960s. Now think about it, after we've had a period of rising inequality for decades. And this is really the first significant measure that will boost the living standards of many low-wage uh, workers and their families and will improve economic security for the middle class. And just consider how it will change the realities of health insurance. You just have to remind us all of these basic, well-known facts. But still, these are the core uh, issues uh, at stake. So, you know, in most states, insurance have, insurers have been able to deny coverage to people they deem to greater risk. They've been able to exclude pre-existing conditions. They've been able to charge however much they want based on health, age, or other characteristics. Subscribers whose health deteriorates often had their coverage canceled. And under what have been the prevailing rules, insurers have had an incentive to design every aspect of their business so as to avoid individuals with high health costs. And people who obtain coverage individually or in small groups have gotten an especially bad deal because they lack the purchasing uh, power of, um, of large employers. And as a result of these and other problems, we now have more than 50 million people. My God, that's the size, that's the population of Spain, I think. It's really, it's, it's a large, the population of a large country. 50 million people um, without uh, health insurance, as well as million, mo millions more who discover that their policies are inadequate when they actually get sick. Um, what will the legislation do to change those realities? Well, it's going to expand coverage first by extending eligibility for Medicaid to people with incomes under or near the federal poverty level, people who have not had coverage in many states in this country. And second, by subsidizing private insurance for people earning up to four times the poverty level. The estimate is that more than 30 million people, we actually don't know how many, but more than 30 million people will gain coverage as a result. And the basic rules of insurance will change so that insurers will no longer be able to exclude pre-existing conditions, charge according to an individual's health. Re they'll be required to issue a policy and to renew it for any legal applicant. And while they can vary premiums by age, they're going to be able to do so only within limits, uh, unlike today. The law's central organizational innovation is uh, the insurance exchange. Um, an exchange that is set up to offer multiple plans, initially for people in the individual and small group markets, but potentially for a larger group uh, later on. Um, the exchanges are really uh, essential to making this all work, to policing the market, to restructuring the market. And a key aspect of the exchanges, which I think that's it. It's a key aspect to the whole reform. It applies to the exchanges. It's also supposed to apply to insurance outside the exchanges. It is the idea that the insurers are going to be paid according to the actuarial risk of the population they enroll. So that insurers who enroll a relatively healthy population will get relatively less. Those who own an older, who enroll an older and sicker population will get more. And that is the hope is will reduce these incentives to cherry picking, for, for cherry picking that have dominated the market. Um, as you know, some of these reforms are being carried out in the short term before 2014. Um, so actually, as of uh, this month, uh, insurers can no longer exclude pre-existing conditions uh, in children. Uh, they have to cover uh, young adults up to age 26 under their parents' uh, policies. Some people deemed uninsurable 
by private insurers are going to be able to get coverage through state level high risk pools that are financed to a very limited degree uh, under the legislation. That's potentially a big problem down the road. Uh, another provision um, limiting, um, uh, uh, setting minimum amounts insurers have to spend on claims uh, on their so-called medical loss ratios is aimed at getting uh, the insurance companies uh, to cut back on their administrative costs and to devote more of the premium dollar uh, to uh, health care. Um, but without the broader measures that go into effect in 2014, <clears throat> there are inherent limits uh, to these reforms. Uh, if, for example, before the establishment of the exchanges, uh, federal regulations demand uh, relatively high uh, medical loss ratios in the individual market, uh, some insurers um, are going to stop writing coverage entirely. Now, uh, that's not entirely a bad thing. Uh, some insurers that have pursued particularly aggressive policies in the market uh, would, not be, would not be missed. And remember that the insurance industry agreed to reform because costs have been rising so fast in the individual and small group markets that those markets have threatened to implode. So it's not as though the situation has been stable or is stable prior to the legislation. We've got a, 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 a situation that is, that is actually deteriorating. Um, but until the mandate and the exchanges are affected, it's going to be very difficult to get insurers to behave in the way that the legislation and many even in the industry uh, envision. Well, despite the denunciations of uh, this legislation as a federal takeover, uh, it leaves much of the responsibility uh, for implementation to the states. And that was also true of uh, the Clinton plan, whose purchasing alliances were going to be state-run. Uh, this time around, uh, the House bill called for the federal government to run the insurance exchanges unless states demonstrated a willingness and capacity uh, to do so, while the Senate bill gave that responsibility to the states unless the states failed and then the federal government would step in. Uh, the Senate's bias in favor of the states I think is partly institutional. The Senate was actually was of course set up to represent the states. Many senators are former governors. Um, uh, uh, ben Nelson, one of those former governors who was a senator and who insisted on this particular provision. Um, uh, after Scott Brown uh, cost the Democrats uh, their 60th vote, we got the Senate bill. The Senate bill had state-run alliances and state-run exchanges. And as a result, um, that is where we are. State control of the exchanges inevitably leads to a long rollout of the program. Uh, federal control might have permitted a more expedited schedule. But once you have state control, once state legislatures have to act on, on complementary legislation, once the states have to pass their own regs, once the states have to set up, you've got a whole uh, timetable that inevitably gets stretched out further. And that's one of the reasons, not the only reasons, because the fiscal reasons were also <laughs> important, uh, why this legislation doesn't go into effect until 2014. Now, because the states already run Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program, it was not an unreasonable thing to put the exchanges in the hands of the states, uh, because there's going to need to be coordination. Uh, among these programs. Uh, there needs to be one port of entry for low-income applicants who shouldn't have to know in advance which of these various programs they qualify for. There has to be one, should be one unified, coordinated system that will um, uh, try to reduce the tremendous complexity of American health policy so that it is manageable uh, for, um, uh, for um, uh, uh, everybody involved. But the states vary a great deal in administrative capacity as well as receptivity to health care reform. Massachusetts, as I mentioned, provided the prototype for the exchanges. And it didn't take Massachusetts four years to get uh, its health connector up and running. Uh, it actually took four months. Uh, and the reason that uh, Kingsdale and, and uh, people he gathered around him were able to get it up and running so fast was in part because they had um, 
two kinds of advantages which will not exist in other states. Massachusetts had already created something <coughs> called a virtual gateway, a single online automated system to uh, its uh, uh, programs. And uh, the Health Connector was, as Kingsdale put it to me, able to glom onto this uh, 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 new uh, uh, system that was already up and running. They didn't have to build it themselves. And um, in fact, if you live in Massachusetts, uh, you can go to that site and uh, you can fill out an application and get your health insurance within 30 minutes. That's really extraordinary, uh, you know, if you think about it in comparison to what people have to go through in most of this country. And um, if you want to see why insurance brokers are unhappy about this reform, uh, that's, that's, that's the reason. <clears throat> Uh, many of them are going to find that their services are no longer needed. Uh, I saw an article recently saying that the insurance brokers will be the, quote, first victims of health care reform. Oh, please. If we're going to reduce the administrative overhead of the system, that's exactly the kind of cost that we ought to be going after. Now, Massachusetts had uh, another distinctive feature that was um, very important to successful implementation. The business community and the leading hospitals and uh, managed care plans in the state were all very strongly supportive of reform. Um, in, in fact, one of those organizations in Massachusetts that lent a hand was the Boston Red Sox. The Red Sox had several of their stars do advertisements telling people that they had to get health insurance and how to get it. And business paid for uh, uh, an advertising campaign, a marketing campaign, as the date approached. Now, um, unfortunately, in much of the rest of the country, the business community, the insurers, uh, I don't know about the baseball teams, but uh, you know, we're, uh, there's not likely to be that base of cooperation. Kingsdale told me that he, he had four months, four months, uh, between the time he walked into his job and the time the whole system was supposed to be up and running. And he said that he was able to enter into contracts with the managed care plans on a handshake without the plans having yet gotten, having, having entered into contracts with their providers. And he said he didn't know how their lawyers let them do it. There was, again, a general sense of trust and cooperation and urgency in getting the whole thing to work. Are we going to see that in the rest of the country? Now, they have more time. But do they have that level of cooperation? Will they, will they eventually get that cooperation? So most states don't have the kind of administrative capacities that Massachusetts had with its, administrative, with, with, with its virtual gateway. Um, they also generally don't have insurance departments, or many of them don't have insurance departments with the um, uh, experience um, and capacity to enforce uh, the laws. So there's very likely to be uneven Im implementation of the Affordable Care Act in different parts of the country. In a recent article uh, for the American Prospect, um, healthcare journalist Joanne Kenna, who is a Princeton native, the daughter of, daughter of uh, one of our colleagues here, uh, divides the states into three broad groups in regard to the implementation of the uh, health care reform legislation. So first there are the ready and willing states. These are the states like Massachusetts, Vermont, Wisconsin, Hawaii, and Oregon. States that have strong traditions of progressive health policy as a result of which they typically have lower than average numbers of uninsured and the administrative capacity and support to undertake the new reforms. Those are the places where I would expect <coughs> to see the most successful implementation along the lines of Massachusetts. Second, there are states that are willing but broke. States like California, where there is a lot of support politically for universal coverage, but state government is obviously under severe financial stress. In the case of California, where it has been paralyzed politically. Uh, the federal government does provide um, nearly all of the money for the expansion of Medicaid and all of the money for the affordability subsidies for people with incomes up to four times the poverty level. But many states 
are having difficulty maintaining the Medicaid programs that they already have. So they are going to find it difficult uh, to carry out the law, although it is going to bring them new revenue. <coughs> now, in a, and finally, there are the hostile environment states, the red states, where the governors and other political leaders have been denouncing uh, the law, insisting they will fight the feds to the finish. In those states, there is often a very wide disparity between the political rhetoric and the views of people inside the state government, many of whom are, act, are eager to carry out the law and are uh, preparing uh, to do it. Now, how these tensions are going to be resolved there between the political leadership and the bureaucracy is not yet clear. In a perverse twist, because the federal government will cover 100% of the cost of expanded eligibility for Medicaid and CHIP, but not 100% of those who were previously eligible but not enrolled. The states that have had the most limited eligibility up till now, typically the red states, stand actually to receive more money under the Affordable Care Act than do the historically generous blue states. I don't know if you followed all that, but the, if you've got a lot of uninsured and you had a very stingy Medicaid program, you're going to get more money from the federal government. If you had a relatively generous Medicaid program, uh, but there were a lot of unenrolled people who could have qualified, you're actually not going to get as much money relatively. And this provision, this is amazing you know, when you think about this in terms of uh, the political science of it, I mean, shouldn't state representatives have voted their state interests? How is it that the states that will get the most money had representatives who voted against it, and those that actually don't do as well uh, voted for it? But that is, uh, 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 ideology was more important here than state interest. Um, now, one of the things that may happen is that in these red states, there are going to be a lot of providers, the hospitals um, and others, who will see the potential for a very significant flow of revenue. Uh, there is tremendous advantage for them in having this law carried out. And so, oddly enough, in those states, the advocates of you know, the, sort of the progressives on the left in those states, there aren't many of them in some of those red states, but they will find themselves politically allied with the healthcare interest groups, which they've often fought with in the past. They will find themselves allied with them against the Tea Party dead-enders. At least that's what I would expect to happen uh, as this uh, plays out. Um, one of the key issues in implementation in the states is going to be whether the states can prevent adverse selection into the insurance exchanges. Now, adverse selection is the disproportionate enrollment of people with high health care costs, and it's been the primary reason for the failure to create um, successful health insurance purchasing cooperatives on a voluntary basis. Inevitably, people with and groups with the highest uh, risks sign up, insurance rates rise and soon become prohibitively expensive, and the purchasing co-ops fail. Many people might have thought that Social Security and Medicare taught Americans the need to have these programs established on a mandatory basis. Uh, you need to have everybody in the programs for them to work successfully. Um, the Clinton plans alliances uh, were mandatory, but one of the things I remember from um, that period, one, one Democratic senator telling me in 1993, that his colleagues really just didn't get this idea of adverse selection. They could not, it just, he could not get it across to them. And they were continually making things voluntary that actually that aren't, weren't going to work very well if they were set up on a voluntary basis. Now, the Affordable Care Act gets around this problem, or may get around this problem, may not get around this problem, by having states' community rate premiums for policies in the individual market, whether or not they're sold through the exchanges. But it's going to be up to the states to carry out that um, 
uh, that policy, and it's going to be devilishly complex uh, for them to do it and for them to stop what may turn out to be a, uh, a, a, a deterioration within the exchanges. Okay, so now this brings me back to um, the subject of the individual mandate, um, which is probably the single most unpopular aspect of the healthcare reform legislation. But it is one that I think can be compromised, can be softened without fundamentally undermining the law. Um, according to uh, an AP poll that was done in early September, only 25% approve of the mandate, 49% oppose it, with the rest not professing an opinion. Um, the mandate's the focus of constitutional challenges to the law. For the opponents, I think it, it symbolizes government overreach. But there is a compromise <coughs> available. It's, it may not be ideal, but I think it's a way to maintain reform while giving the, 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 the opponents an important concession. So this is an argument I've been making for a while. I made it in an op-ed in the New York Times uh, late last year. It was too late to have any influence on the legislation. I made this case, though, in, in conversations with Henry Waxman and various other members of Congress. Uh, 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 I, I, I made it in the hope of averting a backlash, which was the title that I gave to one article that I wrote about this, uh, because I was worried. I was worried partly because I had done a number of uh, call-in radio shows and gotten angry uh, callers. And it, was, it seemed to me so tragic. People without health insurance who were afraid of the mandate. I mean, this was aimed at helping them. But from their point of view, they said, I know what health insurance costs. I can't afford it. You're going to require me to buy health insurance? And I try to explain, well, there are going to be these subsidies, and there'll be the insurance exchange. From their point of view, you know, that, they couldn't hear that. All they knew is how expensive it is now, and that they couldn't pay for it. And we were talking about requiring them to pay for it. And so people who ought to have been supporters were opponents of the law. So the, isn't there some way we can provide an opt-out under the law? Now, I, the, there is a good rationale for the mandate. I just mentioned we have mandatory participation in Social Security and Medicare. What we want to prevent is um, essentially opportunism. We want to prevent people from only paying for an insurance when they need it, when they get sick, F refusing to insure until the point where they get sick. And you can't have an insurance system work if people can come in and out of the system only as it suits them. Obviously, insurance only works if healthy people as well as sick people are paying into the funds, into the insurance fund. So um, uh, is there, but there is there any way to provide an opt-out? Well, um, there was uh, an idea that occurred to me on the basis of um, a provision that I had heard about in the German health insurance system. And seeing Uwe Reinhardt here, I'm, I, 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 I have to confess, I don't know the details about this, and you can probably um, uh, explain it much better and correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, it allows, or it has allowed, uh, the more affluent to opt out of the state insurance system, but it denies them, if they do opt out, the ability ever to get back in. And since a one-way lifetime opt-out seemed to me rather harsh, I suggested a more limited five-year opt-out. And the idea is that um, you would have the option, without paying any penalty, of making a declaration on your tax form that uh, you were opting out of the health insurance um, subsidy system, that you, would, you agreed that you would not receive any subsidies, um, any of these affordability subsidies for health insurance for a period of five years. You couldn't come back in to the exchange and expect to get them during that time. Um, uh, you could also, I would also offer people the option of uh, going from year to year and paying a penalty. Now, the, the penalties that it are in the law are actually very light. And um, they, there is no enforcement behind them. It's not a crime uh, to, to not pay the penalty, by the way, even though it's on the tax form. There's no, there are no liens. The Congress was afraid of putting real muscle behind uh, the mandate. 
So in a way, <coughs> they ended up with the worst of both worlds. This stoked all this opposition because they created a mandate, and then they created such a weak mandate that actually many people will find it's, that they, they don't suffer any penalty if they ignore it. Um, uh, so um, Congressional Budget Office did not estimate 100% compliance. In fact, many people will, according to CBO, not comply. And it may turn out in the first year to be even worse because in the first year, the penalties are trivial for not complying with the mandate. The premise of the law is that the law will create a norm of compliance, that people will be law-abiding and wish to do it, not that there's really any force behind the law. So um, I have tried to um, uh, uh, propose this alternative as being both <clears throat> more libertarian and more tough-minded. <laughs> more libertarian in that, OK, let's give people an opt-out this five-year opt-out, people have to think very carefully. Do I really, opting out for five years means I can't get those subsidies, I can't get back in if I get sick. Now, that, that doesn't mean they can't get health insurance through an employer, and it doesn't mean that they can't get Medicaid. I, I'm not willing to go that far, but I'm saying they can't get these affordability subsidies for a period of five years. That's the idea. Um, uh, or they can pay penalties from year to year, but those penalties should be a lot stiffer than they are in the current law. Now, will this result in fewer people insuring? I'm not sure, because the current law is so weak in its enforcement provisions, we really don't know how many people will comply with the mandate as it is currently written. Um, but my hope is that if we could say, if, if at the end of the day, a congressman could say at an angry town meeting, look, if you really don't like this, you can opt out. There's no penalty. You don't, if, if you don't want to go along with this, you don't have to. I think that would be a great benefit in, in, uh, in helping to sustain the law politically. And actually, what I'm really hoping for now, since it didn't get in the law originally, is that um, depending on how things work out at this election, uh, that there might be uh, some coalition of moderate Republicans and conservative Democrats who could put this kind of proposal forward as a way to amend the law and, uh, uh, and help it uh, uh, ultimately survive. Well, the health care reform roller coaster may not be over. <laughs> if the Republicans win one or both houses of Congress this fall, um, they are sure to try to roll back the legislation. Uh, presumably, <coughs> President Obama will veto any repeal. But that doesn't mean that the reforms are going to escape untouched. Uh, there is first of all going to be a need for technical corrections and other uh, uh, friendly amendments to the reform. It's going to be extremely difficult to get those passed if we have a gridlocked Congress in the next two years. Uh, and there is also a possibility for unfriendly amendments, unfriendly corrections being attached as riders to appropriations bills and various other things. And in some cases, it may be very difficult uh, uh, for the president uh, to, uh, 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 to stop all of them. Uh, so there is a, a considerable possibility, I think, of, uh, it depends how, it all, how the numbers all work out in the new Congress, of seeing some significant erosion, if not an outright appeal. A re 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 repeal. Now, there is a slight possibility of um, a positive uh, shift where there could be some renegotiation um, including something like uh, my five-year opt-out, many other proposals. Uh, you know, in a reasonable political world, it would happen. Unfortunately, we're not living in that reasonable political world at the moment. Now, may maybe, maybe it will develop, but uh, I see no reason uh, to count on it. Um, uh, if in 2012 the Republicans win both the presidency and the Congress, I think they have enough time to enact a budget reconciliation measure in the first half of 2013 that could void the coverage expansion scheduled to take place the next January. Um, that just seems to me entirely plausible, feasible. Uh, some observers who have said that the Affordable Care Act is going to be impossible to reverse the way Medicare and Social Security were in the past, I don't think they've read the situation right. Uh, I think it is possible that this will be undone. Social Security and Medicare, I just want to come back to this. Social Security and Medicare created very powerful 
political coalitions that have <clears throat> helped to sustain them over the decades, made it unthinkable to uh, undo them um, or substantially cut them back. Both programs have created a sense of entitlement among the elderly on the grounds that during their working years, the elderly contributed to the program. But the Medicaid expansion and affordability subsidies in the Affordable Care Act are not protected by a similar belief that the beneficiaries have earned them. And I think this is a, a source of political weakness that over the long, even if the bill isn't repealed, even if it gets carried out in 2014, I think this could well lead to the erosion of the value of the program in the long run. It, there's a reason, after all, that we've got 50 million uninsured. Despite their numbers, the uninsured are mostly um, low-wage workers and their dependents. They're disproportionately young. They don't have any collective organization or representation. I mean, it's shocking that so many millions of Americans could be left in a state of economic insecurity, exposed to financial ruin and destitution and sickness. But we have a lot of people in this country epitomized by the Tea Party who resent paying taxes to provide coverage to people who they think haven't earned it. And that viewpoint is very well represented today in the Republican Party. If health care reform is to survive, I think it can survive in two ways. One way is that the Democrats could stay in power long enough to make the program irreversible. The other way is that enough Republicans could come around and discover that the program Democrats enacted actually corresponds to what a lot of them were always for. <coughs> now, since we have a political system in which one party sooner or later gives way to the other, the second course would be the best way to see health care reform implemented over the long run. Two points politically. The way this is rolling out has one of its most popular provisions, the coverage to age 26. I'd like you to comment on that, whether that will change the political landscape at all. And secondly, is there a point at which big business will jump in, not big insurance, but big business like <coughs> the auto industry or something like that? Jump in and Well, the auto industry it? used to be big. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, you can't take, well, you, you give people something, yes. now you're proposing the 26-year-old, and you're proposing to take it away. Oh, no, no, I don't think that would be taken away. I think, okay. no, let, let me clarify it, what I said. I think that if we have a Republican president and Congress elected in 2012, they have enough time to undo the coverage expansion that would be scheduled to appear, that would be scheduled for January 2014. Mm -hmm. I think many of the things that have, already been done through regulation would be left. Now, one of the things that I, I, I mentioned in the little thing I wrote in the Times last week was that because the legislation um, gives a lot of discretionary authority to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, it is possible to rewrite a lot of these regulations. And I could well imagine that a new Republican administration would revise some of these regulations that they couldn't repeal. And that could make a big difference in what their significance was. But I think the 26-year-old thing is going to stick. I don't think that's... I'm, but won't that generate more support for the law? Well, it isn't showing up in the polls. Um, you know, you see basically um, a stable situation. Um, depending on the polls, you see slightly more, slightly fewer being opposed. Uh, but it's, it, it, it hasn't substantially changed. Now, one of the interesting things in that polling data is that most of the, uh, the, the age group that is most opposed, and in some polls it's the only age group that's opposed, um, are people over age 65. And that, I think, in a historic sense, is just a tragedy. I mean, it just, you know, Democrats expected by enacting Medicare they would create the foundation for universal health insurance. The idea that the elderly would become uh, an 
uh, uh, opponents of extending coverage to other people. Just nobody in the 60s expected that. And as I said, it's, it's really, it's just, it's just tragic when you think about it in those historic terms. Yes? I'm kind of astounded at your optimism. Um, I can't hardly believe that you could have confidence in an industry that could design a program that would exclude a child with a pre-existing condition that you could have confidence in such an industry reforming itself or not coming up with new ways to astound us in their immoral behavior. Well, I guess, you know, uh, uh, I think about these things um, from the standpoint of um, uh, a sociologist who believes that the behavior of organizations uh, responds to rules and incentives. And the way the market was structured in the past created incentives for insurance companies to behave in the ways that you and I agree are important. But it's not, I don't believe it was the um, essential moral turpitude of the people involved that was the cause of that. I believe it was, it was the law that was actually the origin of it. And that changing the law can change the way these organizations act. And I, I just want to actually say something that may surprise you. Um, I think the, uh, the health insurance industry um, uh, could have interpreted its interests in the past two years more narrowly. And, uh, and I think it was, um, uh, I think it's to the credit of the leadership, uh, Karen Ignani and a uh, number of members of her board, which, by the way, include uh, Jim Roosevelt, who's a grandson of Franklin Roosevelt, uh, uh, who's the head of, 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 uh, of a managed care plan, terrible, terrible managed care plan. Uh, they, they uh, I think, um, interpreted their interests in a way that make it possible for us to move forward. And, um, and I think it's a good thing. Yes. It's been some time since I read about it, but uh, it seemed to me when they were when uh, things were written about the Massachusetts plan, yeah. that the response several months after it was implemented from the people was generally not that positive, and financially that it was <coughs> not sustainable. No, actually, uh, the Massachusetts plan has continued to enjoy overwhelming public support. Uh, it continues to be very popular, um, uh, so I don't think that's that's right. Now there there are problems with cost containment in Massachusetts, and the the Massachusetts reforms didn't really address that. They address coverage. They didn't really address cost. Now they actually they they do help in one respect that I mentioned before. People in the individual and the small group market have. Uh, face an incredibly inefficient system that's made insurance unnecessarily expensive. And the exchanges really do help them in that, uh, in that regard. Uh, but um, uh, but I, I think it's wrong. I think, I think if you check, uh, you'll, you'll find that the public opinion surveys still show the Massachusetts program is overwhelmingly uh, supported. And by the way, you know, it's, it's one of the ironies that Scott Brown voted for the legislation. He says he still supports the Massachusetts reform. And he said during that campaign in January, uh, uh, we've already got the reform. You know, what do we care about the federal reform? He said, why should we be subsidizing people in Georgia? Mm -hmm. well, that, which is great if people in Massachusetts never expect to leave the state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Do you think the mandate portion will be challenged in the Supreme Court? Well, the mandate is going to be challenged. It is. I, We'll see whether the case reaches the Supreme Court. There is a question as to whether or not um, the states that have challenged it have standing to challenge it. And um, there's going to be a lecture uh, a month from now in this series uh, by Tim Jost, who argues that, in fact, it's very clear the states do not have standing to challenge it, and that there really can't be any challenge, according to him, until um, 2014. And if that is true, I, and I really, I, I hope the court takes that view, 
it would provide time to work this out politically. And I would I you know, hope there could be some compromise reached of the kind that I described or some other compromise. Um, uh, because I think it would be very, very unfortunate for, um, uh, I, mean, I, I don't know how the Roberts Court would rule. I yeah, would not right. predict it. Uh, but I, And I think conservatives better be, really think very carefully about whether they want the court to rule that um, it's unconstitutional to require people to pay for a private um, uh, plan of this kind. And because the whole concept of privatizing Social Security really relied on the same idea. And they might be creating a precedent that would, that would make privatization of Social Security illegal. They, they better watch out. Uh, so um, uh, the, the, I, I, I don't really think even the Roberts Court would say this is unconstitutional. But you know, again, I, I, that's not a prediction I would like to make. Yes? Is there ever any evidence of small businesses or entrepreneurship or any kind of economic activity taking place in Massachusetts more so than would have before the plan? I, I, I can't answer that question. I don't, I, don't, um, I don't know if somebody's done that research. That's a fascinating issue. And uh, um, I'll, I'm going to look into that, in fact. Thank you. Yes. This is a dovetail on that, sir. Can you comment on what the bill says for small businesses, like the impact on small businesses? Well, uh, the That's, sir. I mean, I, I don't. I appreciate your enthusiasm. I just don't agree. Yeah. Um, well, the like bill. The bill the provides is, tax credits. I think ideology yeah. is small business, and then long-term sustainability. Right? right. That's what the Republicans have pitched as the problem with the bill. Yeah. Well, the the bill provides um, very significant tax credits. Uh, well, I don't know. It depends on your point of view about how significant they are. The, the bill has tax credits for small business to provide insurance to their workers. But look, um, actually, one of the most interesting experiences I had during the whole debate over the bill was that I, I, um, I had a call from the National Federation of Independent Businesses to come down and talk with them. Uh, NFIB in the early 90s was the most vehement opponent of the Clinton plan. But this time around, it was different. The leadership and the staff of NFIB was very open to this legislation. In the end, they didn't support it. But they had come to the conclusion that the current system screws small business. Now, they have a real organizational problem because at the local level, a lot of their members are insurance brokers. <laughs> and, uh, but, but the reality is that they, uh, they like the idea of the exchange. The insurance exchange is a good thing from their point of view. Uh, and uh, I think um, uh, no, uh, I think I, I think when they see it in practice, they'll like it even more. So um, the combination of the um, of the tax credits and the insurance exchange that provides uh, uh, easy access uh, to uh, uh, choices for insurance. Um, uh, where, by the way, there's a significant range, perhaps too great a range in the uh, in the in the value of the policies. I think I think it's going to work out better than you than you expect. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the financial sustainability and what the prevailing political and economic shocks are? Because I know there are a lot of cost control measures in the law, but I still hear predictions on both sides. Well, um, actually, you're going to hear later in this series. I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, continually invoke the rest of the series, but you're going to hear Peter Orzak come talk about the um, long-term fiscal implications of um, of health care reform, um, and um, and I I was in fact talking to him just recently about this, and uh, we're talking about the problems with the CBO forecasts, and of course he ran CBO <laughs> for a time, but he was saying there is a uh, um, an asymmetric bias within CBO. And interestingly enough, that bias operates to overestimate costs. If you look at the history of CBO's estimates on Medicare reforms, and there was a terrific op-ed piece by a guy named John Gable in the New York Times in 2008, I think, uh, which you can check out on this point. CBO has consistently overestimated the costs, underestimated the savings from Medicare reforms. 
And it's, um, there's a, a skepticism. Um, unless there's clear empirical evidence, they're not going to, um, they're not going to score savings from a lot of changes. We, I dealt with this when I was in the White House in 93. Um, we couldn't convince them to score significant savings for managed competition. There are a, a variety of issues uh, uh, today. So, so what, what Peter Orzag was saying, so I wouldn't be surprised if it turns out better than people expect, that the, that, that the, that the costs work out to be lower. Now, there is overwhelming skepticism about that. In that AP poll that I referred to uh, uh, earlier, there's a question in the poll. I wish I had the data here for you. Uh, you can find it um, online someplace, I'm sure. Um, uh, they asked, um, uh, they said, the Congressional Budget Office is an independent agency that makes estimates of the cost of federal legislation. Do you think the CBO estimated that the health legislation will, A, raise the federal deficit, lower the federal deficit, or have no effect on the federal deficit? And if I recall, 81% said they expected it would raise the federal deficit, that the CBO had. Now, the administration and Democrats in Congress worked so hard to modify the law so that CBO would show savings. And the thought was, this is going to have a big political impact. And more than 80% don't believe it anyway, even though they went to all that trouble. And in fact, that's one of the reasons they postponed the law from 2013 to 2014. It's an extra $250 billion to go back one year. And um, the, the, uh, the shame of it is that they really didn't get the political bounce from that that they were expecting. So, no. yeah. Would you comment on the recent story about McDonald's asking for a waiver from the uh, health care legislation? God, I, do, I don't know about that, I'm afraid. McDonald's asked for a waiver? They, they the grandfathering. That the oh, the grandfathering. I'm afraid I don't know about that. I, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, a lot of just, I just haven't followed up. Yeah, in fact, uh, the one thing that strikes me about health care in general, if you look at it in the very big picture sense, uh, it's effectively a zero-sum game. That is, the people who are not insured end up going to the emergency rooms, and some part of our health care system ends up paying for their care. Now, of course, you can count that some people are going to just fall off in the street and die, and there won't be any health care for them. But I expect that's a fairly small percentage and a small amount of dollars in the big scope of things. So in the context of it being a zero-sum game, how is it that everybody is so uh, frightened or afraid of having everyone insured? Well, I, you know, um, I think the way many people understand this is that Health care is very expensive. Health insurance is very expensive. We have 50 million uninsured. God, that's going to cost so much more to provide them coverage because of how much it costs for my family. It's, it's hard to conceptualize this in the way that you are suggesting, that actually there's a lot of money in the system. And indeed, that is the way that the Senate Finance Committee approached it, that, that um, the money for reform had to come from within the system. And so a lot of what is being portrayed as a cut in Medicare benefits, which is a cut in updates for payment rates, that's an attempt to claw back <laughs> revenue, which is now going to go in the form of coverage of people who are previously uninsured. I mean, after all, if we didn't have provisions that clawed back some revenue, the legislation would just be a boom to the insurers and providers. So, um, uh, 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 but this kind of explanation is just very hard to get across. And, and those of you who can communicate it better than I can, God bless you. <laughs> yes? Uh, if the current health reform uh, isn't gutted, uh, do you think that it would naturally lead to uh, further measures like a, yes. like a public option or single payer? Well, I, I, uh, I don't know about um, leading to a public option or single payer. I don't think that is very likely. Um, um, I mean, it could. The, the, a state, by the way, could actually, right now it could establish an insurance company if it wanted to. Um, 
and it could certainly do it under this legislation. There's nothing to prohibit it. There is also some provision, I think it's like as of 2017, 2018, I can't remember which states will be able to get waivers. And, and uh, this was described to me as the Bernie Sanders Orrin Hatch provision. <laughs> uh, because uh, Bernie Sanders wanted there to be some way for a state to have a single payer system in the future, and Orrin Hatch wanted some way for them to opt out and do something more market like or whatever. And so there is some waiver provision. I think the state has to satisfy all the you know, a whole series of uh, requirements under the federal law, but then it can do it in a different way. Um, so, you know, it's possible. It's possible. There is, there, there are a number of um, provisions in the law that could turn out to be sleeper provisions, that could turn out to be more important or that could be made more important in future years. There is a provision for a basic health plan that um, uh, many people thought was not going to be very significant. Now, I've heard from some that it is. It is actually, some people think of it as a stealth public option that uh, will allow states um, uh, uh, to, to do things that, that weren't expected by many people who, who, um, uh, who are involved in legislation. Well, you know, these are, the, they're often, it's a complex piece of legislation and the states may be able to act on them in ways that were not fully anticipated. Yeah. Historical question. Did you see um, Jimmy Carter's comments about Ted Kennedy? Yes, I did. Blaming him mm -hmm. for, for not, us not getting health reform in the late 70s. Yeah. So what did you think of that? I thought it was uh, just disgraceful. Uh, that, um, so, I mean, the story of that is that Jimmy Carter put off dealing with health insurance until you know, well into his administration. He kept saying to um, Kennedy and the unions, yes, 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 we're going to, he had promised in his campaign at a moment when he needed union support, he said, yes, I'm going to have national health insurance. I'm going to support national health insurance. When he got in office, he didn't do anything about it. And um, uh, uh, Kennedy and the unions uh, kept, um, um, kept pushing him. And um, uh, they brought out a plan which has been which, which, which uh, I think Carter completely has, has, has consistently misrepresented um, uh, because Kennedy's plan represented a big departure for both him and the unions. This is, in, this is now 1979 uh, uh, because it was a plan that called for private health insurance. It, uh, it abandoned the idea of a single payer plan. That was a big shift for the unions at that point. Kennedy had already left that, um, broken with that earlier. Um, but um, um, uh, Carter, um, uh, Carter came out with a, uh, a very uh, um, qualified uh, program that was going to go in stages. It, would it, it, it was, it, it was going to require further action and, and a whole series of phases and begin at very low level. It was, it was a completely inadequate proposal. And so I think, I think Kennedy was right. Uh, and I think um, uh, for Carter to blame Kennedy for the fit, first of all, Neither of those programs could have been enacted. So the idea that it was Kennedy's fault is just ridiculous. It was, it was Carter's bad leadership. I mean, Carter was remarkably uh, unsuccessful on almost every domestic issue. I mean, it was, it's across the board. He, he was, uh, I think, without question, the worst Democratic president uh, in the course of the 20th century. Uh, there's nothing that he succeeded on uh, in domestic policy. Israeli Palestinian time. Yes, that was a great success. But welfare and so all the other great initiatives that, that he you know promised, nothing, nothing really came of it. <clears throat> As you see, I'm not a fan of this. <laughs> <laughs> why why all these breaks with uh, the single payer idea? Is it a political thing or is there some fatal flaw in the idea of single payer insurance? <clears throat> well, um, the fundamental problem. Um, with um, single payer politically uh, is that it would require raising in taxes all the money that is currently that currently goes into the health insurance system through insurance premiums and the difficulty with that is that the great majority of people with private insurance have employer provided insurance and they are under the impression that they get it for free or almost for free now, this is not true, objective. 
but it's in their minds. They don't actually see that it's not, that money doesn't first come into their pockets and then go out of their pockets. They don't experience it as a cost. So you're telling these people who feel they're pretty much getting uh, health insurance as a f benefit of employment, they're getting it for nothing almost, you know, well, you know, just their share of the premium. Now, now you're going to put a tax on them? It just doesn't look like a good deal to them. And it's, it's, it's been the problem from the, you know, once we developed an employer-based system and we had this system where um, there were these tax benefits that people got because the employer contribution wasn't counted as taxable income, once we set that in place, we created a tremendous barrier to enacting a tax-financed single-payer system. So that, I think, is, is fundamentally what has stood in the way, not to mention the opposition of all the healthcare interest groups. And right now, I mean, the reason that Medicare wasn't expanded is, um, you know, there was a moment there at the end of the Senate uh, battle when there was talk about opening Medicare to people ages 55 to 64. Okay. And you probably heard that Joe Lieberman stopped that from getting passed. But that, that's not really the full explanation. The truth is Al Franken, Tom Harkin, and others were just as opposed to it. And the reason has to do with um, the fact that in the Midwestern states, Medicare hospital payment rates are relatively low. They're down in the bottom. And the, even the liberal Democrats from those states could not live with the consequences of expanding Medicare. They didn't really want it. And so, it, you know, they let Joe Lieberman be the guy who got blamed for it. But the truth is a lot of, a lot of Midwestern Democrats weren't willing to go along with it either. And that's, that's yeah. the fundamental problem. You've got, you've got these complex relationships between these different payment systems. And they create um, a politics that in some ways makes no sense, but that's, you know, that's, that's what happens. Yes? Uh, to go back to your proposal, uh, the opt-out proposal. Yes. Um, I have a couple questions, I guess the detail that I wanted to discuss. First is, uh, is there any evidence that it would actually work, meaning that would it, you know, have comparative numbers to the individual mandate in terms of enrollment? And second, um, just uh, like a technical aspect is, if, if you decide not to opt out, Yes. Um, would, would you then be penalized if you then did not enroll in, in an insurance plan at some point? So, so how, how would you um, commit folks who do not opt out to actually buying insurance? Okay, so on the first question, is there evidence? I'm proposing something that doesn't exist. I can't point to an example. That is a real problem with this kind of a proposal. Uh, I, I admit that. Uh, it's a proposal that would give people, the people you're talking about, three alternatives. One, get insurance coverage you know, through the exchange. Two, with, with a subsidy perhaps, depending on what their income is. Two, um, take this five-year opt-out. It means you can't get those subsidies for five years. It does mean, well, let, let, let me just go on. And the third option is to pay the year-to-year -year penalty. So yes, if you didn't enroll for insurance, if you didn't take the five-year opt-out, there would be a penalty, right? And the idea is then, it, frankly, that if Congress provided the opt-out, it could also set a penalty that would be strong enough to get people to comply. I mean, you know, I, I, I think it is important to try to bring in as many people as possible, even while trying to satisfy this opposition that says it's too great a federal power. So I'm saying, let's have an opt-out but let's have stronger penalties for those who don't take the opt-out and, and who don't get insurance. Yeah? No? Yes, yes. Uh, I don't profess to understand this whole thing very well, but I am a retired nurse, and it seems to me that most of the people who are so worried about you when you said they, they see their benefits as provided free by their employer. Um, they're so worried about having their taxes raised a little bit. Do they have any concept of how much money and time is being spent every day on these multi-payers? I mean, how, how much money the doctors have to spend, the hospitals have to spend, 
getting people to do all this paperwork and mailing and phoning and everything, right there you would save, I'm sure millions, probably billions, I don't know the, the, the figures, mm -hmm. right, right there. I mean, it's, if you're ever in the system as anything besides a patient, it's just mind-boggling. Yes, and really it would have been much better long in the past if we had not created so many different programs so such a great multiplication of different health plans. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you entirely. It's added more complexity than we need to the system. But at this point, it's not possible just to erase all these things. Uh, but we I don't can't. Know we can't unwind who it. Who understands so, the complexity? Yeah, yeah. Anyone? So what? <laughs> what? Uh, what? We're, what? 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 Uh, the federal government is trying to do is to. Um, uh, 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 use um, uh, electronic uh, uh, technology to use. Uh, 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 there's money under the stimulus program and uh, effort to create um, uh, simplified uh, electronic transactions so that, in spite of the fact that there's a lot of complexity, it won't cost as much uh, but, to deal but with. But we haven't even begun to do that. I'm, <laughs> I'm reading a book called The Healing of America, and we think we're so technologically advanced compared to other nations. There are so many nations in the world that just carry a card uh -huh. and go to uh -huh. the doctors anywhere in their country, uh -huh. any doctor, <laughs> and their, their whole records from immunization <laughs> to pops up. I, and I, we're so advanced, but we're still trying to figure out how to implement this either. and <laughs> let people be able, every little doctor office and hospital be able to yes. afford to have this system. Yes, it's, yes. I have to tell you a story. During in in in, uh, <clears throat> in 1993, there was some newspaper story that said this is at the very beginning when the Clinton plan was under development that uh, the Clinton administration was going to require people to carry a card, you know, which would have their health records on it, and a policeman could stop you by the side of the road and look at your health records. Could demand to see the card. I don't think there was anything that generated more telephone calls <laughs> and more outrage. The whole idea that there'd be some uniform card that had your medical record on it. So it, the, the, the paranoid style is alive and well in American politics. And it is very difficult to do the kind of thing that you're talking about, even though we're, you know, we're trying, I think, to bring about some kind of simplification and automation and so forth, to cut the cost of the system. But, there are all these obstacles. Yes. Well, one more. Okay. Last question. Yeah. Uh, please excuse my ignorance for being outside of the uh, American politics, uh, but I'm doing also research uh, on healthcare reform in developing countries, and that's one thing I don't get it here. Uh, I understand the behavior of, of the the. the uh, interest group business uh, involved in healthcare industry in the U.S. I understand the frustration from the legislature, but what I don't understand and I don't get it is why is a taboo to have public procurement of health insurance in the U.S. If the public, the whole public, already go to election to choose a good guy to solve problem, and why can't the public trust that the state can also be? A good guy in facilitating good service. I live with. I study. I live in Sweden. I live in the UK, and I research about healthcare reform in 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 Taiwan. And and there, there when you manage to to go over the hurdle, to to make law change, you can, as you say, you can change the behavior of all. But if you can create a one-stop shop. In this state, like in Sweden or in the UK or in Taiwan, where I see and where I am the beneficiary of the system, where you have the national, for instance, a national um, insurance board to, to procure own health insurance there. But then you can leave it open to the market to have multiple service provider, regulated competition, uh, fair competitions, and, and, and then I think it would have been bad, but here, what I don't understand is the public yes, is helping. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think yeah. the only <laughs> no, no, the only way to answer that question is history. There's um, a history here because those that that was the basis 
for many proposals for national health insurance uh, through the 20th century and uh, had things worked out differently uh, during the 1930s and 1940s. That is what would have developed in the United States. But those options were blocked at that time. And instead, um, other forms of health insurance grew up. Um, and they grew up in a way that um, didn't just create some very powerful private interests to defend that system, but they also, I think, created a protected public, people with uh, uh, good jobs who got good health insurance, then the elderly who got covered under Medicare, a few other groups like veterans who had the veterans hospitals. All these groups enjoyed some special protection, and it became very difficult to create a political majority in favor of replacing those separate programs with one unified program. It just became too difficult for the American political system to do. And it has to do also partly with the fact that political change in the United States is extremely difficult. Uh, it is very hard to bring about large-scale change like this. We have a system where you know, legislation has to pass both houses of Congress, has to pass the Senate now with 60 votes, with a supermajority. Uh, uh, th there are so many ways to torpedo change. And so you take this fundamental problem that history created and a political system which has all of these obstacles built in, and then you end up with the partial measures that we have been taking to try to correct to fill in, um, uh, uh, to, think, to put things back on track. I'm sorry. That's, that's, I'm sorry to okay. make, uh, take a long time. But that's one last cl clarification. I mean, for me, just to put myself now, I am also in the system here now when I, since I live here. But just to sort of look at America pay about 15% of GDP to health care. Um, more, more now. More. Yeah. And the UK, 9%. Sweden, 9%. Yes. And we have entirely universal free uh, to services. And then from the public opinion, I, what I don't understand is that as an individual person, I'm super vulnerable to insurance company. The flourishing and booming of insurance and powerful they are here, you should already know that I can never win over the convincing the insurance company to, to take my side. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand the public <laughs> opinion. <laughs> Pay more and get less than any other country. But why well, do people it, oppose it? Why do so, people for example, it? the figures that you mentioned, the share of GDP in the United States versus other countries, uh, people who, who study the subject know about that. But uh, Americans generally don't know much about what, is, what goes on in other countries. It's, they, don't, they don't view it from that perspective. They don't, they don't see it that way. So it's, it's uh, you know, there's been a tremendous gap between the understanding that um, health policy analysts have had and um, uh, uh, generally a lot of elite groups have had and the perspective, the understanding, the experience that, that most ordinary people have of the healthcare system. It's, it's not that they're entirely happy with it. There's a lot of cynicism about the insurance companies, plenty of cynicism. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of cynicism about all the alternatives, including any alternative that involves the federal government. So you have um, um, uh, distrust. One of the, I'll just say, say this last thing, we're going to wrap up now. One of the things I think that's made healthcare reform so difficult is that for the last several decades, uh, this has been uh, a low trust political environment in the United States. And something, you know, it's inevitably complicated. And to, to bring about complicated change requires a certain level of trust. People are never going to know all the details. Uh, but every time there have been these proposals, you get this paranoid suspicion 
that buried deep in them, there are these secret provisions that are going to pull the plug on grandma, that are going to bring about these, the, the, these evil things. Well, they, it's a reflection of, of um, uh, a, you know, uh, a disease in the body politic, really, uh, that, that there, is, uh, that, um, there is that paranoia. And if we can, let me just say this final thing, if we can bring about this change, maybe we can show that um, political reforms can actually work and can solve a problem that seemed unsolvable. Thank you.